Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and today I've got something really cool and new and special for my YouTube channel. For the first time ever, I'm doing a dermatology clinical dermatopathology path correlation video. So I've invited my friend, uh, Dr. Josette McMichael, to share the clinical aspects of Kaposi's C sarcoma, and then I'm going to cover the pathology. So if you wanted to go straight to the medical learning, click the video description below and there'll be a, a link to the time where we start talking about the, the clinical of Kaposi and then the pathology. But for the rest of you, I'm going to just take a couple minutes to talk about Dr. McMichael and how I know her. So she, uh, Josette McMichael, was a uh, dermatology resident at Emory University when I was there doing my dermatopathology fellowship. So I got to work with her in real life and actually I met her in real life and then later she got online. Uh, so it's kind of the reverse of how I meet most people these days. Um, she is a really fantastic person, and uh, she doesn't know that I'm going to say this, so she'll probably be mad at me for, for giving her some praise. But really, she's an amazing dermatologist and a lovely person. And um, she uh, works at Emory, but has traveled all over the world um, uh, seeing patients and providing world-class dermatology care, and uh, which is, I think, really amazing, and I'm truly impressed by that. But also, she has acquired uh, an amazing amount of clinical images, and she has wonderful skill, and she's an excellent teacher. So I hope that you enjoy uh, this video, and um, if you like it, please make sure to leave comments down below. Uh, if you want me to, to do more videos like this with Dr. McMichael and other uh, guests to do uh, the clinical and the pathology correlation, uh, please let us know and, and uh, I'll make it happen. Okay, here's Dr. McMichael's uh, Twitter account, uh, Global Dermy. So be sure to follow her on Twitter at Global Dermy if you want to see some really incredible uh, dermatology cases. And uh, I learn so much from her still to this day. And she's also on Instagram and uh, posts uh, similar cases there, a lot of times with kind of quiz features, and you can swipe to see extra images. And really, I mean, she just has a page full of absolutely incredible clinical images, really rare things, really unusual um, dermatologic entities from around the world. So if you're not following at Global Dermy on Twitter and Instagram, you are totally missing out. Now, without further ado, here is Dr. McMichael to teach us about the clinical aspects of Kaposi sarcoma. Hello, I'm Dr. Josette McMichael, dermatologist and adjunct assistant professor of dermatology at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. Dr. Gardner has asked me to discuss with you the clinical aspects of Kaposi sarcoma before he talks to you about the pathology. Kaposi sarcoma, or KS, is a vascular neoplasm caused by human herpes virus 8, which we usually just call HHV8. It's usually low grade and it's a multifocal systemic disease with four clinical variants and three stages. And we're going to talk about those. Most cases involve the skin, but it can also affect mucosa, lymph nodes, and visceral organs. There are three stages, patch, plaque, and tumor, and the stages are the same regardless of the clinical variant. The stages can often coexist. You can see in our elderly male patient here that he has patches, plaques, and nodules all coexisting. Patch stage will present with red or violaceous, which is purplish macules coalescing into patches. And with the plaque stage, you'll get thickened plaques. They can be a variety of colors. Some of that depends on the, the skin phototype of the patient. It can be red, blue, purple, brown, even almost black sometimes. And then with the tumor stage, you'll have larger nodules arising from plaques, and they may ulcerate. Our patient here has several small ulcerated nodules around the ankles, and this larger exophytic ulcerated nodule on his toe that was hiding under a blood-soaked bandage. Sometimes it can be quite darkly pigmented, again, often depending on the skin phototype of the patient. And in fact, KS was at the top of our differential for this patient, but we even included metastatic melanoma because of the dark color. There are four variants of KS. There's AIDS-related and non-AIDS-related, and then within the non-AIDS-related category are classic KS, African endemic KS, and iatrogenically induced KS. Classic KS is seen mainly in people of Mediterranean, Eastern European, and Ashkenazi Jewish descent. It's mostly in older patients, usually older than 50. And in previous literature, it was found to be predominantly in men, but the newer research has shown that the incidence 
incidence is more equal. Patients will present with red violaceous macules on the distal lower extremities, usually starting on the feet. It's often not recognized by patients and you'll want to remove the shoes and socks in order to consider this diagnosis. The lesions can coalesce to form large plaques or even develop into nodules and tumors, and it's quite indolent over many years. After many years, systemic lesions can develop in the GI tract, lymph nodes, and other organs. The visceral tumors are usually asymptomatic, and it's important to realize that up to a third with classic KS, a third of patients, will develop a second primary malignancy, and it's most often going to be non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of African endemic KS. This is usually seen in young children and middle-aged adults in equatorial Africa. It's not associated with HIV. It can resemble podoconiosis, and that's a bilateral lymphedema from soil exposure to bare feet. It's found especially in certain highland areas of Africa, and I think especially of Ethiopia when I think of podoconiosis where they have at least a million cases. And this is a patient that I saw in Ethiopia with protoconiosis. Within African endemic KS, there are four subgroups. There's nodular, florid and infiltrative, and lymph adenopathic. And nodular variant will resemble classic KS in course and appearance where the patients have multiple lower leg nodules and tumors that progress over many years. And the florid and infiltrative type are more biologically aggressive. And then even worse is the lymph adenopathic type, which is quite different from the others. This mainly affects children and the primary tumors involve the lymph nodes and it's usually fatal. There's also KS from iatrogenic immunosuppression and that can also be called transplantation associated KS. This is clinically similar to classic KS. Skin and mucosa are most commonly involved, but it can be disseminated. And this is one of the variants that can resolve if the immunosuppression is removed, but of course that's often not possible for these patients. And it can be aggressive and even fatal with long-term high-dose immunosuppression. AIDS-related KS, this is the most aggressive type. It occurs mainly in men who have sex with men, also IV drug users, but also female partners of affected men and in women from parts of Africa and the Caribbean who be came HIV positive through heterosexual contact, can also have AIDS-related KS. In Africa, there's an equal male to female incidence among HIV positive patients. Another statistic that is important to realize is that up to 40% of men who have AIDS and became HIV infected via homosexual contact can develop KS, so very high percentage, compared with less than 5% in other risk groups. And we see this most commonly in people that have CD4 counts less than 500. Age-related KS usually begins as patch stage and progresses from there. It can be anywhere on the skin. The trunk and mid-face are common sites, and especially the nose is common. And here's a patient of ours with age-related KS on the nose. The lesions are frequently oval-shaped and may be along lines of skin cleavage, as you see in both of these photos. It frequently involves viscera, including the GI tract, also lymph nodes and the lungs. And about 20% of patients will have simultaneous visceral involvement that places them at risk for hemorrhage of GI lesions and even and perhaps more significant cardiac tamponade and pulmonary obstruction. You always want to check the oral mucosa, and if you see oral involvement, that should definitely prompt you to search for underlying GI involvement. I showed this patient's photo earlier as an example of ulcerated KS. He had initially presented to us with a diagnosis of acroangiodermatitis. He had a biopsy that was red as that, but he had no HHV8 performed. We repeated the biopsy and we biopsied a nodule this time. I think they had biopsied a patch and it was consistent with KS and the HHV8 was positive. And pseudocapsid sarcoma is a benign angioproliferative disorder most frequently arising in the setting of chronic venous insufficiency. It does clinically resemble KS, and so it can be confused with that. And even histologically, if you have an early lesion of KS, it can look similar to acroangiodermatitis.
but it, oftentimes the biopsy can distinguish. And certainly if you're able to do an HHV8, then having a negative HHV8 will exclude KS. Let's talk about treatment for a minute. Cure is not possible in most patients with KS, and our goals of treatment are mainly symptom reduction, prevention of progression, and cosmesis. For the skin, treating the visible lesions is the most important, and that can really make a big difference in, for people's self-esteem and just giving them some control, even if they have widespread illness, giving them some control over this difficult disease. There are lots of treatment options, and this is relevant for all the subtypes. Surgery is generally reserved just for removal of a few lesions if they're symptomatic. Cryotherapy, laser therapy, photodynamic therapy, intralesional vinblastine or vincristine, or just superficial patches or thin plaques, topical altretinoin, or miquimod, or even combining them can be used. Radiation is a Great option if there is multifocal, relatively localized KS, especially for the classic subtype. In the AIDS-associated type, it may not have a long-lasting effect and may get recurrence. The chemotherapy is often required if there's extensive multifocal disease. There have been reports of, of many other agents being effective, and some of those options I've listed here, bevacizumab, that's an anti-VEGF antibody. Thalidomide and lenalidomide are immunomodulators that inhibit growth of blood vessels. There's IL-12, also imatinib and serafinib, which are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and then bortezomib, which is a proteasome inhibitor. And just a couple of pearls for specific subtypes. KS from transplant immunosuppression. If you can reduce immunosuppression, you may get improvement of the KS. So there's one way to do this is to start um, sirolimus and stop the cyclosporin. And we're not really sure why that works. If it's just reducing the level of immunosuppression, or if maybe there's a more direct anti-tumor effect related to the inhibition of hhv 8 induced effects. And Older immunocompetent patients that don't have HIV, they've got stable disease, it's a reasonable option to just observe them with close follow-up. Heart therapy is helpful in AIDS-associated KS, so antiretroviral therapy. This may cause a flare, but it, it generally doesn't necessarily mean that there's a worse prognosis if they get a flare. And I would say that this is the first line agent in, in any patient you have with AIDS who's not on heart, you want to get them on heart. And about half of these patients will get resolution of their lesions. It's going to take a number of months for that. But that's the first line therapy, especially if it's mild to moderate disease. Thank you. And now I will turn this over to Dr. Gardner to take you through the pathology. Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and now we're going to talk about the pathology aspects of Kaposi sarcoma. Huge thanks to my friend, Dr. Josette McMichael, for covering the clinical features and, um, and giving us uh, all of that awesome info. Okay, this is a good example of a punch biopsy from an early lesion of Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, probably patch stage. So patch and plaque stage um, can have kind of overlapping features. Um, patch is obviously the earliest form, and as you would expect from the clinical appearance, it's going to have a lot less stuff going on microscopically. And when it's really early, it can be very difficult to recognize, um, and it can be easy to miss. So here is what we are looking for. The dermis looks a little busier, I would say, than normal. There's more stuff going on. There's not a ton of cells. You can't, you can't really appreciate that many cells, but you can see there are some little white spaces. Uh, which are in here. There are some little white spaces in between the collagen bundles. There's some hemorrhage. You can see blood. And there are a, there is a subtle increase in spindle cells, which could even be like, you could think from low power, it's fibrosis or fibroblastic. And I think that's real easy. The, the spindled um, endothelial cells of early Kaposi sarcoma look a lot like fibroblasts and, and very um, easily can mimic fibrosis. The other thing I want to draw your attention to here from lower power before we go in for a closer look is this eccrine coil down here. It's not real happy. The, the uh, lining of each of the little tubules is kind of atrophic. There's some increased cellularity in between the individual tubules of the coil. 
and um, and there, the tubules are being kind of spread apart by that. So something's kind of infiltrating this coil. Those are malignant endothelial cells from the Kaposi sarcoma, and that's such a useful clue that I find very helpful to making the diagnosis, okay? So let's go in closer and see what we're dealing with here. First of all, here are the little slit-like spaces or open spaces um, in between collagen bundles that are very typical of Kaposi sarcoma. And again, this is really early. Imagine getting a small shave biopsy of this, especially with limited clinical information, it can be very challenging to make this diagnosis. You can see that there's hemorrhage. And hemorrhage, it can be a problem because we often see red blood cells uh, in the dermis on biopsies, and sometimes those are real hemorrhage that occurred in the patient, um, and sometimes they're artifactual. It's blood that got spilled during the biopsy process, and it can be a little challenging to tell that apart. Um, two things that help me is seeing scattered little little uh, scattered red cells here in the superficial dermis, rather than a big huge mass of blood, just scattered red cells. I usually think that that ends up being real, true, in vivo hemorrhage that's really there in the patient. The other thing is if my dermatology colleagues tell me this is a violaceous or a purpuric or erythematous lesion, or they tell me they're worried about a vascular tumor or about vasculitis, or even if they tell me they might be worried about a pigmented lesion, like a melanocytic lesion, those are all to me evidence that, they're, that the blood I'm seeing uh, could be real. And of course, if we find hemocytorin, that's further evidence that we're probably dealing with true hemorrhage from the patient, okay? Rather than artifactual bleeding that occurred at the time of surgery, or biopsy, excuse me. So these little spindle cells here, you can see that, that some of them line the spaces, okay? But also you can see that the little spindle cells stretch out into the collagen away from the uh, vessels. And those are actually endothelial cells. And if you do um, immunostains, you'll see that they stain for CD34 and ERG and, um, and um, uh, the human herpes virus 8, HHV8 immunostain. We'll talk about that at the end of the video. The other thing you tend to see in Kaposi sarcoma, it's not always present, but when it is, it's a nice clue, is this. This is called the promontory sign, okay? So here what we have is a little uh, vessel that is surrounded by a bigger vessel. So this is like a, a dilated vessel of Kaposi right here. I'm trying to, let me see if I can get my arrow to show up better. That's a little better. This dilated little slit-like vessel of Kaposi is kind of starting to wrap around this pre-existing vessel and it's leaving like a little hill. I guess I've got it upside down, but a little hill or a protrusion or a promontory that's bulging into the lumen of this dilated space. So that's a, a clue that's often talked about in Kaposi. In my experience, it's only seen in a subset of cases. So if you find it awesome, but don't don't use that as your, your sole criteria for making a diagnosis of Kaposi, you will, you will miss cases, all right? Here's another example here. You can see these, these little round vessels here that are kind of a vessel within a vessel, or in this case, several vessels within a vessel, this dilated channel that's wrapping around these pre-existing vessel structures, okay? Um, the other thing is, again, the hemorrhage, which is really useful, and somewhere up here I was gonna bring up a point. Oh yeah, right here, what you can also see in some cases of Kaposi is that the vascular channels really start to dissect the part of the collagen bundles. And this can be really prominent in some cases. It's pretty subtle here. When it's very prominent, it can mimic the, the growth pattern that you see in angiosarcoma, okay? It's really super important to tell apart Kaposi sarcoma from angiosarcoma. It might be tempting to think, well, they're both vascular and they're both malignant, but they are night and day difference as far as treatment and prognosis goes. Angiosarcoma is aggressive. It's treated aggressively and has a potentially bad outcome in many cases. Um, and I have another video about angiosarcoma and other vascular tumors. I'll put a link in the video description down below. Um, but Kaposi sarcoma, as Dr. McMichael uh, mentioned, is, is really, even though it's not curable, it is very indolent usually and is often uh, can be managed in a palliative manner and, and can be treated to some extent. But so it's a very different approach to this, uh, to Kaposi and to angiosarc. So telling those apart, if you have any doubt, really important to do the HHV8 immunostain and also to use your clinical um, clues to guide you. If it's a scalp of an 80 year old sun damaged person and it looks like Kaposi, I will never believe that until I see a positive HHV8 stain because to me that's much more likely to be an angiosarcoma in that clinical setting. All right, so let's look closer here at this eccrine coil. Again, you can see it's not a very happy eccrine coil. If you need an example of what a happy eccrine coil looks like, go check out my normal skin histology video on my channel. I'll put a link for that down below too. Um, 
And uh, here you can see that the, the individual um, uh, tubules here of this eccrine coil, they're kind of dilated and atrophic. And again, they're spindled cells and little slit-like vascular channels dissecting in between and kind of infiltrating this eccrine coil. I don't know why Kaposi sarcoma likes to do this, but it's a very typical and characteristic feature. In fact, if I ever see anything from low power that's starting to fill the spaces in between the tubules of an eccrine coil, I instantly think, oh, could this be Kaposi sarcoma? And so that's a really useful clue. Again, you can see kind of a little promontory sign up here, a little vessel within a vessel. So this is a nice example that has all the features, but it also displays just how subtle and how hypo cellular Kaposi sarcoma can be in its early um, patch stage. Now, let's look at some additional examples here to get a uh, better feel for kind of the range of findings that, that we can see um, in different cases. And as Dr. McMichael uh, mentioned, the uh, the, the different forms of Kaposi, whether it's the classic type, the endemic type, the HIV type, those all look essentially the same microscopically. The, the microscopic appearance does though vary based on the stage, whether you're dealing with early patch or plaque stage, or if you're in the, the larger nodular tumor stage. All right, this is probably a nice example, I would say, of a plaque stage uh, Kaposi. And you don't have to report that in the report. Just saying Kaposi sarcoma is usually enough. The staging really is done on a, on a clinical level. But I think it's important to understand the difference microscopically because the pattern that you're going to see under the microscope is going to look different um, in tumor stage Kaposi versus earlier lesions like patch or plaque stage. And we'll get the tumor stage in a moment. This is a nice example, though. It's a lot more cellular. You can see there's increased cellularity in the dermis. These are mostly spindled endothelial cells. You can see even from low power, those little cleft-like and slit-like spaces dissecting between the collagen bundles. You can see some hemorrhage down here. You can see an eccrine coil that's been kind of infiltrated by some cells. You can't see yet what those cells are, but you can tell that there's something in between the tubules of this eccrine coil. You can also see even from low power, vessel within a vessel. Uh, the, the promontory sign. This case actually is the best example of promontory sign I think I've ever seen. This is the case I use when I uh, write textbook chapters and stuff about Kaposi. This is like the the most uh, the most dramatic one. And again, look down here. Here's another eccrine coil that's almost completely destroyed. Uh, the individual tubules here, instead of being dilated like in the last case, they're kind of crushed down and really atrophic and getting squished basically and compressed by the infiltrating um, tumor cells. So if you did a if you did a vascular markers here, or if you did a keratin, you could tell that some of these little circles that you're seeing are the pre-existing um, tubules of the eccrine uh, coil, and then the others are all vessels and endothelial cells that are kind of uh, filling up the space where the coil used to be. All right, so let's look, I think over here, there's another finding. There's hemorrhage. Hemorrhage fills a lot of these little slit-like spaces, so this, the little slit or cleft-like spaces filled with blood is a useful clue for Kaposi. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And also, look, the hemosiderin, another, another useful finding that the blood we're seeing, number one, is real. Um, and also, number two, this is a useful clue when you see little slit-like spaces in spindle cells and hemosiderin, always think of Kaposi sarcoma. Do immunostains if needed to exclude that possibility. Um, and then the promontory sign. I mean, look at that. Here is a vessel, a dilated vessel, and it's kind of completely wrapped by this dilated cleft-like um, Kaposi sarcoma channel. Here's another vessel bulging into the lumen of that vessel. So the vessel within the vessel appearance, very characteristic, just not present in all cases. And here's another one. There's another promontory sign. See, it's just dramatic. There's numerous, numerous uh, promontories in this case. Let's look up at the top. I always think it's nice when you have a big punch or an excision to look at the superficial aspect and think, what diagnosis would I have made if I only had a thin shave biopsy of this case? It's kind of a scary game to play because a lot of times you realize, wow, I might have missed this diagnosis if I only had a shave down to uh, here. So this is why it's important to, to make sure that your diagnosis correlates clinically with what the dermatologist sees. And also for you dermatology colleagues watching, it's important to make sure that you do try to give adequate biopsies. Obviously, it's not always possible to give a big deep biopsy it depends on the clinical scenario but do keep in mind that as pathologists we are only able to really work with the material that we're given so that's why I think it's so useful for patho derm path uh, and pathologists who do dermatopathology to work so closely with their dermatology colleagues like Dr. McMichael
Michael and I are doing in this collaborative video. It's a perfect partnership, and that's how we can provide the best patient care. So thanks for letting me have that little soapbox moment. Um, it makes me happy to be able to talk about those things. Uh, as my fellows and residents well know, because they have to hear it every day at the microscope, and now you do as well. So here, though, is again uh, another perfect example of promontory sign, and you can really see how the channels are dissecting and infiltrating here, but the endothelial cells are really small. They're not huge. They're not the markedly atypical endothelial cells that you'd expect to see in angiosarcoma, okay? So usually that's the biggest clue to me, aside from the clinical context, is if I see um, really atypical endothelial cells, I'm much more suspicious for angiosarcoma. Capacity usually does not have dramatic atypia, although there are some exceptions. You can sometimes have in uh, some pleomorphic variants of capacity, particularly in AIDS-associated capacity, although admittedly I've seen very few of those that had really marked pleomorphism. So most of the capacity I've seen in my practice have been uh, relatively bland cytologically. Again, blood uh, hemorrhage here and hemosiderin deposition and um, lots of slit-like spaces and infiltration between collagen bundles. So great example of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, let's see if I can get over here to the cellular zone. So now you can start to see that the cell, it's getting a little more cellular in these areas. You can tell that these little spaces are vascular channels, but these spindle cells in the background, I mean, those could be fibroblasts, you might think they could be histiocytes. They don't look really very spectacular. And so this is where the, the tricky part of Kaposi comes in. The real early lesions are tricky because they have very little cellularity. As they start getting more cellular, it can become hard to tell that the spindled cells you're seeing are actually endothelial cells. So that's why looking at all the other clues we just talked about is really important. And, um, and when you do stains, all of these cells that you might have thought were fibroblasts or, or histiocytes, they'll light up with CD34 um, and other vascular markers, okay? So Kaposi sarcoma, uh, plaque stage. Let's look at a few different variants here. Here's one again where uh, punch biopsy, and you can tell the dermis looks busy, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, look down here. This is the normal reticular dermis. It's got thick collagen bundles and relatively little cellularity. There's a lot more cellularity up here. Uh, some of it might be inflammatory. Others looks like it may be spindle cells. And the collagen, the texture of the collagen in here is different than the collagen of the, the normal reticular dermis. So to me, what you're seeing up here is you're seeing kind of a fibrotic process in the superficial dermis with some increased spindle cells. There's a little bit of hemorrhage, which may be hard to appreciate on the video here, but there is some hemorrhage in there and there's probably some inflammation. So again, it's useful at low power when you see this kind of pattern to stop and, and think about Kaposi sarcoma, keep it in mind. Because from here, you might not look at this and say, oh, it's a vascular tumor. It doesn't really look like that unless you're familiar with the pattern of Kaposi sarcoma. So one really important clue here, and this is like way more dramatic than usual, Let's see if we can get them in focus. Look at what all these inflammatory cells are. They're plasma cells. So it's a little hard because they're dark, but you can see that they've got eccentric nuclei. They've got that pale perinuclear, um, if I can get the arrow right, that pale perinuclear Hoff, which is the Golgi apparatus, and that kind of purpley looking uh, cytoplasm. Uh, and you can't really see the clock face uh, chromatin pattern here just because it's too too dark, I don't know, maybe if I flip the condenser, and now you still can't. Plasma cells are a really important clue for Kaposi sarcoma. They are present in, I would say, the majority of cases of Kaposi. Usually they're not this numerous, but when I see plasma cells in, a, in the setting where there's blood, where there's some slit-like spaces, where there's spindled cells, I always try to keep Kaposi sarcoma in mind, okay? Now remember, you can have plasma cells in chronic lymphedema and in stasis and in other settings where, where you might also be thinking of Kaposi. So that doesn't prove the diagnosis, but it's a useful clue that I find very helpful in making me think of Kaposi. Again, here you can see the, the kind of uh, the slit or cleft-like vascular channels, then the spindled endothelial cells spreading out away from the vascular channels, the little uh, specks of red blood cell here and there that are scattered around. And here, this is a good example. All of the spindle cells, you can tell that these are obviously vascular spaces, right? No problem. But these are also vascular cells. These are all endothelial cells out here. 
all of those are endothelial cells. If you did stains, all this stuff that looks like it might be fibrosis, all of it's Kaposi sarcoma. So on immunostains, you could easily tell that. And again, look at all those plasma cells. Really helpful clue for the diagnosis. Sometimes Kaposi sarcoma, though, will have not just little slit-like spaces, but will have larger dilated blood-filled spaces, spaces that almost look cavernous, like you'd see in a, in a, you know, a vascular malformation or cavernous hemangioma. Now, the diagnosis is usually still pretty easy once you've thought of it, because even though at low power you might think of a hemangioma or a malformation or something because of the, the larger spaces, and the, this section's a little torn up here artifactually from, uh, from the lab, but when you start looking around, in addition to those big blood-filled spaces, you're seeing the other features that we've already talked about. There's hemocytorin in the background. There's slit-like and cleft-like channels. There's spindled endothelial cells infiltrating between dermal collagen. There are going to be plasma cells, all of the stuff that we've already discussed. So um, if, you know, if just it's a mistake you could make uh, just glancing at it quickly or from low power and say, oh, it's just these dilated channels, it's probably a hemangioma. But when you start looking around a little bit more, it's really clear that, that we're dealing with, with Kaposi sarcoma. And then look, there's a plasma cell right there. See, I told you they're usually present. And except when I try to show my residents, I'm like, oh, there'll be a plasma cell here. And then those cases never have the plasma cells. So it's the, the, the law of teaching that whenever you're trying to show something, it's never on the slide that you have in your hand. All right, but I cheated and I prepared these slides ahead of the video, so. All right, let's see now. Let's move into tumor stage capacity. Look at this, this looks totally different than what we're looking at here. We don't have a punch, we have a shave biopsy because this was shaved and removed as a nodule, okay? This was a nodule that was violaceous on the foot. You can see we're on acral skin here. Again, if you need a refresher on normal skin histology, I've got a whole hour and 15 minute video about that. And what you've got is this cellular nodule of spindle cells that's kind of bulging up, and it's wrapped around on the outside by what we call a collarette, a collarette of epidermis. The epidermis kind of invaginates underneath it. This is not always present, but I feel that many cases, particularly on the acral skin that I see of uh, tumor stage Kaposi sarcoma, tends to have this collarette, okay? Here's another view, depending on what angle you cut it, this is the collarette of epidermis that comes under. Now, one other lesion that'll have a collarette is pyogenic granuloma, PG, which is really a misnomer because it's not a granuloma at all. It's actually lobular capillary hemangioma. And, and so uh, Kaposi sarcoma and uh, pyogenic granuloma can look similar clinically and they can look similar microscopically too, um, at least from, from low power. So it's important to not make the mistake of confusing those two. All right, so what things are gonna help us here? Well, when we go down to higher power, it's real clear that we're not dealing with um, a pyogenic uh, granuloma or other hemangioma because what we have is this. We got a lot of spindle cells and the spindle cells are kind of running in fascicles. Let me see if I can find a good area to, to show that. You can see the spindle cells are kind of streaming along in these parallel bundles. Sometimes it can be so, so strikingly fascicular as to, to mimic uh, a leiomyoma or leiomyosarcoma. It can look like a, like a smooth muscle tumor even. The cells in this case are a lot more plump and enlarged nuclei than we saw in the previous examples. So they definitely kind of make you think, well, this is an atypical process, but they're not strikingly pleomorphic, okay? They're not that, that terribly ugly, like, for example, like you would see in an angiosarcoma, all right? So the cellular spindled fascicles um, are a good clue. And then also the blood-filled spaces. Now in tumor stage capacity, the blood-filled spaces um, are a lot more dramatic and they're really the primary clue, I think, to recognizing that you're dealing with a tumor stage capacity. The blood-filled spaces take on two different forms. I'll, I'll come back to that area. Let me show you the, the other, well now, let's see if I can find the other area. Ah, here. So here you have these, these little slit-like spaces in between the elongated um, spindled endothelial cells. And so blood filling these little slit-like uh, spaces in between the cells, really characteristic of Kaposi sarcoma, okay? So if you're cutting these fascicles long ways or um, have a longitudinal section along a fascicle, what you'll see is spaces filled with blood that look kind of slit-like. But my mentor, Mark Edgar, um, one of my soft tissue mentors uh, alongside Dr. Weiss when I was in fellowship at Emory, um, he taught me a really awesome clue that if you cut the fascicle in cross-section, 
uh, rather than longitudinally, the blood-filled spaces look different. They look like little holes instead of slits. And I, no one had really ever taught me that before that I can recall, and I think it's a useful visual clue. Here's a good example. See, here you have individual round white spaces, little holes in between the cells. The cells look more round and less spindled. So it's kind of like a hot dog. If you cut it long ways, it looks elongated and spindled. If you cut it in, in across, it'll look like a perfectly round little circle. The same is true of spindle cells, particularly those in fascicles. If you cut them longitudinally versus in cross section, it totally changes the shape of the, the nucleus that you're seeing on, on that section. So in cross section, the fascicles give you more of this, what, what Mark Edgar called a sieve-like pattern, a sieve like a spaghetti strainer, like when you cook pasta and then drain it out in the sink. There's little holes in the bottom. Imagine those little holes filled with blood. You'll never think of spaghetti the same again, but you'll always remember this clue, and I think it's a really useful um, uh, finding for Kaposi sarcoma. So uh, slit-like and sieve-like uh, spaces filled with blood in the setting of this spindled, um, cellular spindled tumor, really useful uh, diagnostic clues for Kaposi. Let's find the other area that looks uh, sieve-like. Here, I think that's pretty good. Again, you're seeing little little holes that are filled with blood. And these are not like pre-existing vessels. These are actually little tiny vascular channels that are being formed by the malignant endothelial cells or the, the HHV8 transformed endothelial cells here. Now, there's something else I see right here that's worth mentioning. This is an endothelial cell, a Kaposi sarcoma cell, that has these little hyalinized globules or droplets, little eosinophilic droplets. Let's see if I can get it to show up better when I flip the condenser. Yeah, it kind of makes uh, them show up as more refractile. So people have uh, always told me and proposed that these are actually um, uh, phagocytized erythr erythrocytes. They're red blood cells that are being eaten up by the endothelial cells, and then they're being converted into these droplets. I'm not totally sure if that's true, but that's what everyone says, and there are supposedly studies that confirm it. Uh, that to me, they, they oftentimes actually look similar to little uh, protein uh, globules and droplets that I see in a lot of other sarcomas, but whatever they are, um, and uh, one of my fellows told me that these, that a name that's been applied to these is dwarf balls, D-O-R-F, dwarf balls. I had never heard that, and I did search, and there is some obscure literature that does suggest that that name has been applied here. So try that out at your next cocktail party, see what your friends think. Um, uh, this probably explains a lot about my life. Okay, so anyway, the, uh, these little droplets are kind of just a, a, a cool, interesting thing, not super important, but they are often found in Kaposi sarcoma, particularly in tumor stage Kaposi sarcoma, at least in my experience. So now you know about those little uh, hyalinized droplets in, um, in Kaposi sarcoma. Uh-oh, drop the slide into the microscope. Try to avoid that usually. All right, so it'll have to be at a little angle so it doesn't drop. Again, we're on acral skin or near acral skin, as you can tell by the thick corneal layer. And you've got, again, multiple nodules. And notice something here, all of the tumor is this, this nodule. There's actually in the background not really any patch or plaque stage. And in my experience, oftentimes when I see the nodules in, in tumor stage capacity, there oftentimes won't be a good uh, Kaposi sarcoma in the background. And even on immunostains, all the HHV8 is gonna stay in this cellular area and the background is, is basically normal. Sometimes you will see dilated branching vessels in the background that are actually not part of the tumor, but rather are background um, um, dilated lymphatics or va vessels from, from the uh, lymphatic stasis kind of changes that you can get um, in the background of uh, Kaposi sarcoma in some cases. So again, notice that it's uh, a nodule that's kind of pushing up to the epidermis. It's got a nice collarette of epidermis kind of wrapping around it. And at higher power, you can see again, spindle cells and fascicles and little slit-like spaces filled with blood. So nice example again of tumor stage Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, now here's an example of a tumor stage Kaposi that actually doesn't really have that cholerate and is not on acral skin. So this is a big, a big nodule of spindle cells. It's cellular and it doesn't take long to see that we've got fascicles of spindle cells at higher power and the blood-filled spaces are obvious.
um, immediately. There's little little erythrocytes in between, like each 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 spindle cell has an erythrocyte between it. It seems like so the blood's kind of like uh, sprinkled across the surface of this spindle cell tumor. And again, I'd point out, look at how how uniform and bland and monotonous. Um, the nuclei of the um, of the capsid sarcoma spindle cells is it's usually not pleomorphic um, at least in the majority of cases that I see so I think that's important because if you had this you might not look at that and say oh this is malignant at first glance it and I've ha definitely had cases especially ones that don't have much blood where I kind of thought I can't it's a neoplasm but I can't even I'm not sure if it's malignant or not and then once I thought of capsid sarcoma it was real easy and I did an HHV8 stain to confirm it I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute so just another nice example of of tumor stage okay now here, actually, here's the example I was talking about. And this is a, a really good case that taught me a lot. So we've got this large nodule. I think it was on the foot. Big nodule, cellular, spindled. Here's another piece that's very large. And when you go down on higher power, It's made of uh, spindle cells, and they're arranged in fascicles. And you can see some, some little spaces here, some little slits or clefts, but what you don't see is blood. This case, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why, it really didn't have much hemorrhage at all. So, yeah, it's easy when we're doing a capsid sarcoma video to say, oh, well, clearly those are slit-like vascular channels. But artifactually, we see little cracks and slits in the middle of spindle cell tumors of other sorts all the time. So sometimes it can be really hard to decide if the crack or the space that you're seeing in tissue is actually an artifact or if it's actually real. And I've actually got a little short video about that. Um, my mentor, Dr. Rowe, taught me that if you see a white space or an empty, clear, white, whatever you want to call this color, a space in tissue, it's either um, uh, endothelial space, a lymphatic or a vascular space that is, number one. Number two, um, a gland or cyst, basically an epithelial line space. Or number three, it's an artifact of some sort. And I thought that's a real simple but very elegant way to explain the, the options that you have when you see white empty spaces in tissue sections um, under the microscope. So this is one really that we, we scratch our heads about at first because we thought it's a spindle cell tumor. It had some mitotic activity but really not much pleomorphism. And it, I was debating, you know, how do, we, how do we actually solve this? And then once we realized, oh, this is Kaposi sarcoma and the HHV8 was, was blazing positive and all of this. And there's a little hemorrhage here and there, but it's very subtle. So admittedly, I don't see a bunch of cases like this, but I think it's so important because I, it never occurred to me before that Kaposi sarcoma could be so bloodless, basically, or have such such minimal um, blood and be so prominently spindled and fascicular. And, you know, really, you could think about, I don't know, maybe synovial sarcoma, although that'd be rare in the skin. You could think about other things in your differential here, um, and, and really a vascular tumor might not even come to your mind at all because the blood's not there, and you're expecting the blood to be there because that's what we always teach, and that's what's usually there. So I think that's a really good, uh, a good lesson here. And there is one thing I forgot to show. I'll go back to the other case we looked at earlier, is mitosis. So even though I said we don't usually have dramatic pleomorphism, mitotic activity, on the other hand, especially in tumor stage capacity, usually is pretty, pretty obvious and easy to find. So mitoses may be, may be present and they may be even abundant. Like here in one field, we got one, I think it's shown up on the screen, two in the same field. So again, these, these cells obviously are atypical. They're just not wildly, severely pleomorphic like we'd see in a lot of angiosarcomas. But, um, but the mitotic activity is a nice clue. It is often present um, in Kaposi sarcoma. All right, one other thing that I wanted to show before we go on to immunostains is this. This is a lymph node involved by Kaposi sarcoma. So you can see it's a round lymph node. Here's a better uh, section of it, of the normal node that's uninvolved. Well, not totally normal. We got a little bonus finding. There is black, totally black, not brown, but black pigment in the node. And if you see black pigment in the human body, it is not from the human body. It's exogenous. Always the, the human body does not have a way, to my knowledge, to make anything that's truly black. Melanin is not black, it's brown. Hemocytorin is kind of golden brown color. 
we can make different shades of green, red, yellow, brown, but we can't make black. Black is always from outside the body, either carbon from the, the polluted air we breathe in, or uh, metal or amalgam uh, from dental, old, old school dental fillings. Or in this case, this is tattoo, black tattoo pigment that's drained from the skin into a lymph node. So that's a nice little bonus. The patient has a tattoo and you can look really cool if you tell your your surgery or, um, or dermatology colleague, well, I guess your surgery colleagues, oh, hey, look, the patient has a tattoo, right? And then they'll think you're awesome. So try that out and see how that goes too. Here is just like all the other stuff I showed you is basically the similar, uh, same pattern as we saw in tumor stage capacity in the skin, fascicles of spindle cells, perfect example of blood filled slit like spaces. This might even be better than, than any of the cases I've showed you so far. Uh, really nice uh, blood filled slit like spaces between the spindle cells. And there are some plasma cells scattered in here I saw earlier. I don't know if I'll find them now. But do keep in mind that capacity can involve other sites besides skin. It can involve lymph nodes. It can be in the, the rectal mucosa. It can be in the oral mucosa. And it can, in some cases, even involve internal organs like the lung and other internal organs. The important thing to bring up, and this, the weird thing about capacity is we call it a sarcoma, but it's very unique. It's very different than other sarcomas. Um, and, and it can arise in multiple sites simultaneously, and it can regress sometimes spontaneously, sometimes with treatment, like Dr. McMichael talked about. Um, and that's because it's driven by the virus HHV8, right? So, so when you get nodal involvement, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as it would mean, say, if you had a melanoma that was involving a node. What that would be a metastasis. Here, this is not like metastatic capacity sarcoma, or at least not necessarily. This may just be a simultaneous uh, node involvement that's, uh, that's arisen at the same time as the, the capacity sarcoma elsewhere. Um, now, in, when there's a lot of node or organ involvement, a lot of times those are kind of in more progressive cases, and that can be um, a, a potentially a more aggressive form of capacity sarcoma. But it's important to recognize that this is not the same significance as finding carcinoma or melanoma in a lymph node. Capacity sarcoma is a strange, weird disease because it's driven by the virus, and it, it's very different than other types of tumors, which is partially why I find it so uh, fascinating. All right, let's talk about immunostains. So let's talk about the immunostaining aspects of Kaposi sarcoma. Um, when you recognize it, a lot of times the diagnosis can be made just on H&E or, um, or if I see it and I want to confirm it, I'll just do an HHV8 immunostain. But sometimes other vascular markers get used. This is a different tumor than a lot of other vascular tumors because typically I prefer CD31 or ERG as my vascular stains of choice. Um, and those stains will work usually with uh, Kaposi sarcoma, but CD34, it tends to be probably the more sensitive marker here it, uh, than CD31 at least. It's strongly expressed in the majority of cases of Kaposi sarcoma. Here you can see this is a tumor stage Kaposi with the nice fascicles of spindle cells strongly highlighted by CD34. CD31 also will stain often, but, but in some cases it can be negative or weak. Here's an example from that same case. You can tell that the CD31 is staining, but it's actually a lot weaker than the CD34 expression and also a lot weaker when compared to background normal blood vessels. So most other times vascular tumors stain very strikingly with CD31, but Kaposi sometimes is either weak or even negative for CD31. And uh, my friend Leron Pantanowitz um, and colleagues, they uh, wrote a paper showing that actually it's a, a, a protein uh, that's expressed or a gene that's expressed into a protein, I think it's called K5, that is caused by the HHV8 virus in the uh, tumor cells. And that protein actually breaks down and destroys or initiates the breakdown of CD31. So the, uh, the um, HHV8 virus that causes the tumor actually is responsible for the downregulation or the destruction of the CD31 molecule, which accounts for the fact that some cases are weak or negative for 31. So do be careful about that. Um, I don't have a picture of ERG handy, but ERG um, it should stain uh, most, if not all, Kaposi sarcomas uh, from the, the literature that I'm aware of and from my experience. And here's an example of HHV8, um, human herpes virus 8. The, um, this is also known as LANA1, L-A-N-A-1. Here's a, another, a different case from the last one I showed. It's a tumor stage capacity, and you can see strong, diffuse nuclear staining. Now, I'll warn you, not every case looks like this. Sometimes uh, the staining can be very focal and only involve um, uh, a subset of the cells, particularly in early uh, patch stage 
uh, Kaposi sarcoma. So, you know, many times immunostains, we can look at them from lower power and instantly decide if they're positive or negative. But there are certain immunostains that I know can be very focal or very subtle. And HHV, it's one of those. And it's one that if I can't see it right away at low power, I don't call it negative. I go look around for a while at higher power to make sure I'm not missing focal subtle staining. Okay. Here's a closer look. And as you may be able to tell, these are this is a nuclear stain, but the nuclei look kind of different than most nuclear stains. And this is a really uh, important point also about HHV8. It has a very unique staining pattern. It is nuclear, yes, but it tends to have this kind of punctate dot, multiple dots or stippled kind of granular looking uh, staining of the nucleus. Now, not always. I've seen sometimes where it's just a diffuse solid nucleus um, that's staining, but more often in my experience, um, the HHV8 stain looks kind of like this. It'll have little speckled dots on the nucleus. And sometimes, like look at this nucleus here, only a couple dots there. So this is what I'm talking about. If I can't tell for sure that it's positive, if I think it looks negative at low power, I'll go look around and make sure I'm not missing some focal endothelial cells that have just a few stippled dots of staining for HHV8. And essentially 100% of cases of Kaposi sarcoma, at least in my experience, should be positive for HHV8. Um, I mean, it's always possible that a stain can fail, no stain or no test is perfect, but really if it, HHV8 is negative, I would be extremely hesitant to call anything Kaposi sarcoma unless I had some other proof, and, and you may try if you really strongly feel something's Kaposi and the stain didn't, and the HHV8 didn't stain, you may try to have it repeated in a different lab. I have occasionally seen uh, a stain failure for unknown reasons that, that when repeated in a different lab worked. So um, if you have a strong index of suspicion, then uh, you know repeat it just like you would with any stain. But I think it's real important to recognize these little uh, punctate stippled dots of staining in the nucleus that's very characteristic of the pattern of HHV8 staining in Kaposi sarcoma. So I hope you enjoyed this video um, of both the dermatol uh, the dermatologic and the pathologic aspects of Kaposi sarcoma. And uh, hopefully now you feel uh, comfortable with uh, all aspects of this entity. Um, and thanks so much for watching. If uh, you like the video, please click like, leave comments down below. Um, and also be sure to subscribe to my channel so that you'll be notified of more videos like this in the future. Thank you again.